This film will show the procedures to be used with the T-34 aircraft in the event you experience a high altitude emergency. An emergency that occurs at an altitude above 1,500 feet. The landing pattern used in the event of a high altitude emergency looks like this. This pattern uses two checkpoints, high key and low key. High key is 1,500 feet of actual altitude over the point of intended landing, headed into the wind. Low key is at 1,000 feet of altitude, one wingtip distance of being the point of intended landing headed downwind. Your instructor will initiate the simulated high altitude emergency by closing the throttle. You should then commence a transition to a 90 knot glide and check gear and flaps up. Pick the best available landing area and head directly for it. Select a field that is long and into the wind if possible and one that is free of rocks, trees and wires. Check the wind direction by looking for blowing smoke or dust or by remembering your takeoff direction. Check mixture, rich, and propeller in, full increase. Check ignition on, both. Fuel boost pump, on. Fuel selector, on. And harness, locked. Trim the aircraft for the 90 knot glide and open your canopy. Make a systematic cockpit check to determine the cause of the emergency and while gliding toward the landing area make a voice report to your instructor stating your aircraft number, position and altitude, the cause or type of emergency, intentions, wind direction and intended landing direction. As you continue gliding the aircraft toward the landing area, your instructor will clear the engine at each 500 foot loss of altitude. Spiral as necessary to hit high key, 1500 feet above the point of intended landing, heading in the direction of intended landing. Upon reaching high key, lower the gear and start a left turn toward low key. Transition to an 85 knot glide and retrim. Continue your gliding turn so that you pass through low key at 1,000 feet, one wingtip distance of beam the point of intended landing. Prior to reaching the 90 degree position, check and report. Gear down. Brakes firm. Parking brake in. Temperatures and pressures normal. Landing checklist complete except for flaps. Continue the approach to arrive on final with 800 feet of straightaway and 200 feet of actual altitude. Lower the flaps as needed to make a landing on the first third of the field. Transition to 75 knots with flaps down. At this point the instructor will take control of the aircraft and initiate a wave off. At 100 knots, the instructor will return control of the aircraft to you. Make a climbing turn back to a low key position so that the field may be used in the event of an actual emergency. Your simulated high altitude emergency is considered complete upon reaching 1,000 feet. This completes the unit on the procedures used with the T-34 aircraft in the event of a high altitude emergency. Return to the programmed text. The projector will rewind automatically.
This film will show the procedures used with the T-34 aircraft in performing a steep turn, a level turn using 45 degrees angle of bank. Start in normal cruise with the aircraft aligned on a prominent landmark or section line. Do not change trim or power settings during this maneuver. Prior to turning, check the airspace for other aircraft or clouds. Roll into a 45 degree banked turn and apply back pressure as necessary to maintain altitude. Because of the increasing load factor, airspeed must be sacrificed to maintain altitude. Anticipate reaching the original heading and roll without hesitation into a 45 degree banked turn in the opposite direction for 360 degrees. At the completion of the second turn, roll out on the original heading and altitude. This completes the unit on steep turns. Stop the projector and return to the programmed text. This film will show the procedures to be used with the T-34 in performing slow flight. Slow flight is a maneuver in which the aircraft is flown at a near minimum airspeed in which controlled flight can be maintained. Start in normal cruise with the aircraft aligned on a prominent landmark or section line. Close the throttle and advance the prop to full increase RPM. Maintain heading and altitude and retrim as airspeed decreases. At 110 knots, lower the landing gear. Keep scanning the nose attitude to maintain altitude and heading. When the gear indicates down, Apply 15 inches manifold pressure and lower the flaps. The nose attitude must be increased to maintain altitude. Throughout the change of configuration and decrease in airspeed, trim as necessary to maintain level flight. When the airspeed reaches 70 knots, apply 19 to 21 inches MAP. Be sure power is set exactly to maintain altitude and 70 knots. To return to normal cruise from slow flight, apply full throttle and raise the landing gear. When the landing gear indicates up, raise the flaps. Maintain heading and altitude, trimming as the airspeed increases. At 120 knots, return to normal cruise power setting and retrim. This completes the unit on T-34 slow flight. Return to the program text. The projector will rewind automatically.
During times when cloud coverage directly over or near Softly Field is at or below 1,700 feet, the Softly entry is modified to a brake pattern to allow proper aircraft clearance. The brake pattern eliminates the 1,200-foot traffic circle and brings traffic in up the right-hand edge of the runway at 500 or 800 feet. The brake pattern is entered from an initial point located one mile from the downwind end of the runway. Softly Tower will indicate that a brake pattern is in effect by announcing that Softly Field is using a brake pattern home field entry straight in to either a five or eight hundred foot break and specifying the entry cone and duty runway. When the brake pattern is in effect, complete the landing checklist except for wheels, flaps, and prop. Check the quantity of gas in the right and left tanks and report fuel boost pump on, alternate air in, Mixture, rich. Harness, locked. And the quantity of gas in the right and left tanks. Establish a one mile straightaway into the duty runway headed upwind. Enter the one mile initial point aligned with the right hand edge of the duty runway at the designated altitude in normal cruise. Maintain a close watch for other aircraft, keeping in mind that the aircraft most advanced has the right of way. Prior to the one mile initial point, open the canopy. Set the propeller to 2200 RPM and adjust manifold pressure to maintain airspeed and altitude. Report front canopy, open and locked. Propeller, set at 2200 RPM. As you pass over the approach end of the runway, look for the amber beacon or the golf flag to determine the type of landing to be made. When past the RDO truck prior to the upwind end of the runway and number one with interval, roll into a 30 degree angle of bank to the left. Close the throttle and lower the gear at 110 knots. If you are braking from the 800 foot level, when the gear indicates down and locked, add manifold pressure to 13 inches. At 90 knots, commence a descent to 500 feet and a wingtip distance. At 550 feet, apply 23 inches manifold pressure and level off at 500 feet. If your brake altitude is 500 feet, when the gear indicates down and locked, add 23 inches to maintain 500 feet and 90 knots and fly to a wingtip distance on the downwind leg. Prior to a point of beam your intended point of landing, report gear down and locked, brakes firm, parking brake in, Temperatures and pressures, normal. Your brake pattern home field entry is now complete, and you can proceed with a normal landing. If it should become necessary to discontinue your approach, execute a normal home field wave off. Unless otherwise cleared by the tower, depart the pattern and re-enter at the appropriate entry cone. This completes the unit on the T-34 brake pattern. Return to the program text. The projector will rewind automatically.
This film will show the flight attitude transitions used with the T-34 aircraft. First, let's examine straight and level flight. In straight and level flight, maintain a constant altitude and heading. In balanced flight, with the wings level. This is called normal cruise and is flown at 120 knots. To maintain 120 knots in normal cruise, set the propeller at 2,000 RPM and the throttle at 22 to 24 inches. Scan the nose attitude to maintain level flight and check the wings level. To transition from normal cruise to a climb, raise the nose to the 100 knot climb attitude and simultaneously advance the propeller control to full increase RPM. Trim as the airspeed decreases. Keep scanning the nose attitude to maintain the 100 knot climb attitude and when the airspeed reaches 100 knots add full throttle. In a prolonged climb Use gentle S-turns to clear the airspace ahead. Use 5 to 10 degrees angle of bank for approximately 15 to 20 degrees of heading change, followed by a reversal in the opposite direction. To return to normal cruise from a climb, lower the nose to the level flight attitude. Maintain the level flight attitude and when the airspeed reaches 120 knots, return to normal cruise power settings and retrim. The two most efficient normal descents or glides with the T-34 are performed power off at 90 knots and power on at 120 knots. To enter a 120 knot descent from normal cruise, Retard the throttle to 13 inches of MAP and simultaneously lower the nose of the aircraft to the 120 knot descent attitude. Trim left rudder to maintain balanced flight. Maintain 120 knots by scanning the nose attitude and the airspeed indicator. When 50 feet above the desired level off altitude, add normal cruise power, 22 to 24 inches. And raise the nose to the level flight attitude and retrim. You are now reestablished in normal cruise. To transition from normal cruise to the 90 knot glide, close the throttle and maintain altitude and heading as the airspeed decreases. Retrim throughout the change in airspeed. When the airspeed reaches 90 knots, lower the nose to the 90 knot glide attitude and retrim. Maintain the 90 knot glide by scanning the nose attitude of the aircraft and the airspeed indicator. To maintain engine temperatures, clear the engine every 500 feet by advancing the throttle to 18 to 20 inches, then closing it. Keep scanning the nose attitude of the aircraft and continue the 90 knot glide until 250 feet above the desired level off altitude. Then advance the throttle to normal cruise power. Hold the nose at the 90 knot glide attitude and trim as the airspeed increases. 50 feet above the desired level off altitude, start raising the nose to the level off attitude and establish normal cruise. This completes the unit on flight attitude transitions. Return to the program text. The projector will rewind automatically.
Training Air Wing 7 is assigned Area 1 within the A-292 caution zone. Generally, this area may be used from 350 to 7,000 feet for primary flight training. The northern boundary of this training area is the southern edge of the Victor 198 airway and is an imaginary line from the town of Jackson Oak, Alabama to a point on Alabama Route 59, two miles north of Interstate 10, then direct to the town of Molino, Florida. The eastern boundary goes south from Molino to an intersection with Interstate 10, south to Crescent Lake, along Bayou Marcus to Perdido Bay, along the eastern edge of Perdido Bay to the Lillian Highway Bridge. It then goes across the bridge and south along the western edge of Perdido Bay to Alabama Point Bridge. The southern boundary is a line one-half mile inland from the Gulf of Mexico, from Alabama Point Bridge to Little Lagoon. The western boundary goes from Little Lagoon to the western end of the Intercoastal Waterway along the eastern shore of Mobile Bay to Jackson Oak, Alabama. Now, let's take a sample flight to see some of the more prominent landmarks within Area 1. The most familiar of these, of course, is Softly Field. Flying on a northwesterly heading from Softly, we come to 8 Alpha, just south of Interstate 10. This is a grass helicopter training field and must be flown over at a minimum altitude of 1,500 feet. Heading northeast from 8 Alpha, we find Kings Field. Kings Field is a grass field used by T-34s for emergency landing practice and has a minimum altitude of 2,000 feet, if not in its pattern. Northeast of Kingsfield is another prominent landmark, a paper mill. This mill is in the town of Cantonment and defines part of the eastern boundary of our area. It is easily recognized by the pall of smoke it usually emits. Turning west and staying north of Interstate 10, we now come to Four Silo Farm. Four Silo Farm is easily recognized as it is the largest cleared area north of the interstate. Heading west from Four Silo Farm is a 1,450-foot television tower. Note its position just south and west of the diamond-shaped interchange on Interstate 10. Continuing west and staying south of Interstate 10, the town of Loxley is our next landmark. Loxley is the northernmost town in our area on Highway 59 and can be easily recognized by its proximity to Interstate 10. Turning southwest from Loxley, we come to OLF Silver Hill. Silver Hill is used for brake pattern demonstrations and not touch and goes. Like all other outlying fields, it has a minimum altitude within a wingtip distance of 1,500 feet. Flying due east of Silver Hill, we come to Robertsdale. Robertsdale is the next town south of Loxley on Highway 59. Southeast of Robertsdale is Summerdale Field. Summerdale Field is used by T-34s for touch and goes. Turning southwest and maintaining our heading, we come to three landmarks in a row. The first is the town of Summerdale. Next is OLF Magnolia, used by T-34s as a touch and go field. Finally, Weeks Bay, which is located on the western edge of our area. Flying north from Weeks Bay along the eastern shore of Mobile Bay, we come to the town of Fairhope. If we now turn and hold a southeasterly heading, we will come to Magnolia OLF again, and then to the town of Foley. From Foley, looking east, you can see the twin fields of Barron. T-34s use the east field for touch and goes. The west field is closed. 
If we now fly south from Foley to the coast, we will come to Canal Field. Canal Field is unmanned, but can be used as an emergency field. On an easterly heading from Canal Field is Wolf Bay. To the east of Wolf Bay is Wolf Field. Wolf Field is the last T-34 touch-and-go field you will see. Five miles due north of Wolf Field is Kaiser Field. Kaiser Field is another grass emergency landing practice field with an altitude restriction of 2,000 feet. To the east of Kaiser is Faircloth Field. This is another grass field and as it is closed has no altitude restriction. To complete the circuit of our training area, we now head toward Perdido Bay. And finally, Softly Field. This completes the unit on T-34 local course rules. Return to the programmed text. The projector will rewind automatically. Like any other aircraft, you cannot afford breakdown with the T-34 once off the ground. To guard against such possibilities, a precise checkoff system is followed before each flight. This film will show the pre-flight procedures to be used with the T-34 aircraft. Before performing an exterior inspection, conduct a cockpit check. First, the front cockpit. Check boost pump, off. Fuel control, off. Trim tabs, set at zero. Mixture, idle cutoff. Ignition, off. Landing gear handle, down. Emergency gear retract switch, shear wired. Accelerometer, between plus six and minus three. Emergency fuel switch, off. Battery, off. And controls, unlocked. In the rear cockpit, check boost pump, off. Emergency gear retract switch, shear wired. Emergency fuel switch, off. Canopy air pressure, 23 to 3,000 PSI. First aid kit, secure. And inspect for loose gear. Following the cockpit inspection, check the exterior of the aircraft, starting with the port wing. Check the trailing edge of the port wing flap. Check the top and bottom of the wing for signs of overstress or structural failure, wrinkles, or popped rivets. The servo action trim tab on the aileron should line up when the aileron is aligned with the wing. Check the trim tab linkage and that the trim tab bolt can be turned. Also make sure that each of the three bolts has cotter pin nuts installed. Check the port wing tip for damage. Also check the security of the position light. Now check the leading edge of the port wing. Check the landing light. Then make sure that the pitot tube cover is removed. Air speed and flight instruments in the cockpit will not register if the tube is covered. Now inspect the port main landing gear. Check for proper inflation and tread depth 
and make sure that the slip marks line up. Make sure that the outboard fairing door is not bent or loose. And that the inboard door is closed and flush with the bottom of the wing. Check the brake puck for wear and that the brake disc is free. Check the oleo inflation on the wheel strut. Three inches of polished oleo strut should be showing. Check the wheel well for obstructions and the hydraulic lines for leakage. The uplock roller must turn freely and the uplock bracket must have a spring attached to each end. Check the uplock cable for signs of fraying. Check the area around the gear for signs of hydraulic fluid leakage. And be sure the fuel vent standpipe is bent forward. Check the condition of the lower anti-collision light. Make sure that there is no oil leakage from the left augmenter tube and that there are no obstructions in it. Next, the port fuel tank. Check for quantity. Make sure the entire chain is intact and that the rubber seal is not cracked. The port engine section comes next. The chain which secures the dipstick to the tank must be secured at both ends. There should be 11 quarts of oil, although 10 are sufficient for the first flight of the day. Make sure the prop governor control line is not chafing on the mounting bracket. Make sure the red plunger is flush with the top of the filter assembly. If the fuel filter is installed, check the fuel drain switch closed. Check the security and general condition of the engine accessories, wiring, and plumbing. Note any excessive oil leaks. Check the engine case halves or any part for excessive oil leakage. Check the fuel flow divider and fuel lines, the security of the ignition leads, and spark plugs. Inspect the underside of the engine and make sure the alternate air door is closed. Next, examine the nose wheel well. Check the shimmy damper rod for 1 16th to 1 32nd inch clearance on the front of the cylinder and between the rear cotter pin and the cylinder. You should have approximately 5 inches of polished oleo strut. Check the nose gear tire for proper inflation and excessive wear and make sure the slip marks line up. Check the nose gear grounding wire for security and that it touches the ground. Also check the mud guard. Inspect the nose gear brackets, the V brace, and the retract rod for general security and especially for cracks. Make sure the centering roller turns freely. Now move to the front of the aircraft, being careful to stay clear of the propeller arc. Check that the aircraft is sitting level. Then examine the propeller. Check it for cracks, nicks, and dents. Make sure the spinner retention nut has a cotter key. Do not move the propeller. With the exception of checking oil quantity, inspection of the starboard engine section is the same as with the port side. Following your inspection of the starboard engine section, check the fire extinguisher access door. Check the battery drain jar for damage, excessive overflow, and for either black or white neutralizing agents. Make sure the battery is securely fastened and the battery connection is tight. When securing the door, check the alignment of the battery vent tube in the vent housing. Examine the canopy release handle for security. Do not pull the handle. Inspection of the starboard wing, the fuel level, and the landing gear follows the same pattern as the port wing and gear. 
except that there is no pitot tube. Next, the starboard fuselage. Check the static vent holes to make sure they are not plugged. These work in conjunction with the pitot tube. Check the condition of the upper anti-collision light. Check for foreign object debris in the tail section by slapping the underside of the fuselage and listening for loose objects. The tail section comes next. Check the general condition of the dorsal fin, vertical stabilizer, rudder, and the horizontal stabilizer. Check that the elevator horns do not bind on the horizontal stabilizer. Inspect the hinge fittings. All hinges should have a cotter pin nut installed. Check the control connections on the elevators and rudder for cracks and proper security. Also check for freedom of movement of the elevator and rudder. Note that the rudder has an anti-servo action trim tab. Do not move the rudder by pushing on this tab. Check for differential movement of each elevator and the condition of the tail cone and position lights. Inspect the port side fuselage in the same manner as the starboard side. Finally, to complete your pre-flight, check the baggage compartment. It should be empty except for the pitot cover and rear seat cushion for solo flights. Check the security of the canopy air pressure bottle. Make sure its door is closed and securely latched. This completes your pre-flight inspection. Keep in mind that following your flight, a post-flight inspection should be made. This post-flight inspection is a general visual inspection of the landing gear, wing, control surfaces, fuselage, propeller, tail assembly, and engine compartment to discover any discrepancies not previously noted or that occurred in flight. This completes the unit on the pre-flight procedures used with the T-34 aircraft. Return to the programmed text. The projector will rewind automatically. This film will show the taxi procedures and ground course rules used with the T-34 aircraft. After entering the cockpit, complete the pre-start checklist. When ready to start the engine, place the mixture in idle cutoff. Fuel control valve on, fuel boost pump on. Throttle set approximately one quarter inch and prop to full increase. Now. Hold the brakes and lower your visor and make the voice report. Request permission to start, sir. When your instructor acknowledges this report, give the line man a thumbs up indicating you are ready to start. If all is clear, he will return a thumbs up. Continue with your checklist. Checking battery, on, fuel pressure, and landing gear indicators down. Now engage the starter. Count four blades, then move the ignition switch to on. Smoothly move the mixture to full rich and continue cranking. After the engine starts, release the starter button. Set the throttle to 12 to 1400 RPM. Check the oil pressure and turn the radios on. Now check and report each item on the pre-taxi checklist to your instructor. Electrical system checked. Flaps cycled and indicate up. Trim tabs set, six right, three up, 
and zero. Landing gear warning light, checked. Landing gear indicators, down. Gas, full left, full right. Clock and altimeter, set. Inverters, checked and on main. Gyros, uncaged and set. Radios, checked. Instruments, checked for correct indications. Idle RPM, throttle closed and checked. Ignition, checked. Shoulder harness, locked. And finally, whether the canopy is locked open or closed. Report to your instructor that the pre-taxi checklist is complete. The parking brake is in and you are ready to taxi. If solo, a two-way radio check would also be required before you could taxi. Taxiing is the controlled movement of an aircraft on the ground under its own power. Before you can move from the chocks, taxi clearance must be obtained from your instructor. When ready to taxi, close the throttle, hold the brakes, and give the lineman the thumbs out signal to remove the chocks. To start taxiing, check the parking brake in, release the brakes, and gradually apply throttle until the aircraft starts to move. When the aircraft starts to move, close the throttle and apply the brakes evenly to check for adequate braking action. The lineman will direct you from the chocks. But remember, you are responsible for the safety of the aircraft. Taxi speed is controlled by the throttle and direction by the rudder, augmented as necessary by the brakes. Adjust the throttle to maintain a reasonable speed, in no case faster than a man can trot. In the lion area, no faster than a man can walk. 800 to 1,000 RPM is usually sufficient, depending on wind conditions. To make a turn while taxiing, Apply full rudder before firmly applying the brakes, but do not lock one wheel. Turns should be made while the aircraft is in motion. All turns will be made slowly, using a wide radius of turn. To straighten out the aircraft, lead with opposite rudder and opposite brake before the desired direction is reached. If you are required to stop the aircraft, wait until you have come to a full stop and then apply 1200 to 1400 RPM. To taxi to the run-up areas, follow the squadron course rules. When on the taxiway outbound, check the tower and report to your instructor which panel is up, the duty runway, and which side of the solid yellow line to taxi out. When the duty runway is 4, 9, 13, or 18, outbound traffic will use the east or right side of the throat. On runways 22, 27, 31, and 36, outbound traffic will use the left or west side.
To perform engine run-up, the aircraft must be aligned with the heading of the duty runway. For runway 36, each aircraft will be wingtip to wingtip. For runway 31, they would be aligned diagonally. For runway 9 and 27, the aircraft would be on a line parallel to the solid yellow line. When stopping to perform the engine run-up, the nose wheel is aligned with the longitudinal axis of the aircraft. To stop the aircraft, close the throttle and apply even braking action. To do the engine run-up, first check the engine instruments. You must have at least 40 degrees oil temperature and 107 degrees cylinder head temperature. Then report engine instruments normal and request permission to run up engine. When cleared by your instructor, hold the brakes firmly and advance the throttle to 1800 RPM. With the engine speed at 1800 RPM, move the prop control aft to the detent. RPMs should decrease to between 1600 and 1650. Advancing the prop back to full increase should return engine speed at 1800. Cycle the prop six times on the first hop, four times on each subsequent flight. Allow the RPM to stabilize the last time at the detent to read the RPM. To check the magnetos, advance the throttle to 2000 RPM. Then turn the magneto switch to the right position and note the RPM drop. Turn the switch back to the both position and hesitate momentarily to let the RPM stabilize. Then turn the switch to the left position and note the decrease in RPM. The maximum permissible drop for either magneto is 100 RPM. As soon as the mag check has been completed, reduce the throttle to 1700 RPM. The fuel pump check is completed by turning the fuel boost pump switch off while watching the fuel pressure gauge. The pressure should drop slightly but remain above 12 PSI. Return the boost pump switch to the on position. Set the RPM to 12 to 1400 RPM Report to your instructor the number of RPMs at which the prop stabilized, mags checked with the number of RPM drop right and left, the PSI at which the fuel pressure stabilized, and that engine run-up is complete and satisfactory. Next, check and report over the ICS to your instructor each item on the takeoff checklist. Anti-collision lights on. Fuel checked. This includes checking fuel quantity. Fuel control valve on. Fuel boost pump switch on. Fuel pressure normal. And fuel caps secured. Check to be sure the controls are free. Tab set, six right, three up, zero. Alternate air, in. Generator, operating. Instruments, checked and set. Mixture, rich. Prop, full increase. Ignition, on both. Flaps, up. Harness, locked. And canopy, open. Then report to your instructor that the takeoff checklist is complete, parking brake in, and that you are ready for taxi. When the instructor acknowledges this report, proceed to the hold short line for the duty runway. Remain on the proper side of the solid yellow line And when the duty runway is 13, 31, 18, 
or 36, use the broken yellow line to taxi to the hold short line. This completes the unit on T-34 taxi procedures and ground course rules. Return to the program text. The projector will rewind automatically. During your flying career, you will encounter two types of emergencies, those which affect the operational capabilities immediately, such as engine fires and prop failures, and those which will affect the operational capabilities of the aircraft at a later time, such as landing gear malfunction. This film will review the procedures used to handle immediate emergencies, procedures that every T-34 pilot must memorize. Should an engine fire occur during start, the plane captain will signal you by making the infinity sign. Leave the throttle set and retard the mixture to idle cutoff. Turn the fuel control valve off. Check ignition on both. Continue cranking to clear the engine and attempt a start. If the engine doesn't start, Turn the ignition off. Advance the throttle to full open and continue cranking to clear the engine. If the fire continues, turn the battery off and abandon the aircraft. If an engine fire develops after start, you will be signaled the same manner as during start. You may even be able to detect the fire from the cockpit. Retard the mixture to idle cutoff. Advance the throttle full open. Turn the fuel control valve handle off. Turn the battery off. Turn the ignition off. And abandon the aircraft. If an engine fire occurs in flight, the decision to bail out will depend upon the seriousness of the fire. Never attempt to land an aircraft with a serious fire that cannot be extinguished if there is sufficient altitude to bail out. In the event of an engine fire in flight, retard the mixture to idle cutoff. Turn the fuel control valve handle to off. Turn the battery off. Turn the generator off. Turn the ignition off. And close the throttle. Do not attempt a restart. Execute emergency landing or bailout if the fire persists and you have sufficient altitude. Now let's look at the procedures to be used in event of an electrical fire in flight. Turn the battery and generator off. Pull all the circuit breakers to the off position. Turn off all radio and electrical equipment. If the fire persists, make an emergency landing or bail out. To isolate the faulty circuit and to restore essential equipment, push the generator circuit breaker in and turn the generator on. If the generator is faulty, turn it off. Turn the battery on. Check each necessary circuit one at a time by pushing in the individual circuit breakers and turn on the radio and electrical equipment served. If the generator is secured, conserve the battery by securing unnecessary equipment. Extend the landing gear using the emergency system. To eliminate smoke and fumes, Reduce your airspeed to minimize the spreading of the fire. 
push the cockpit cold air handle full in and pull the cockpit hot air handle full out. Open the canopy and determine the source of the smoke or fumes and execute the appropriate emergency procedures. If fuel fumes become evident in flight, reduce your airspeed below 110 knots. Push the cockpit cold air handle full in and pull the cockpit hot air handle full out. Open the canopy and secure all non-essential electrical equipment. Use the emergency landing gear extension system to lower the landing gear. After landing, clear the runway, secure the engine, and abandon the aircraft. A prop failure might occur because of a failure of the governing system or the propeller control linkage. A full low pitch, high RPM condition will result and engine overspeed may occur. If you experience a prop failure on takeoff, commence a climbing turn to low key position. Maintain a load on the propeller. Manipulate the propeller control in an attempt to restore governing. Advise the tower of the emergency and state your intentions. Now, complete the landing checklist. When this has been done, intercept the ELP approach at whatever altitude attained and complete an ELP. If altitude permits, perform an ELP from low key. If you are unable to reach low key, fly the power on approach until a power off landing is assured. If a prop failure occurs while airborne, retard the throttle and start a climb to put a load on the propeller. Manipulate the propeller control in an attempt to restore governing. If the governor will not function or if 2900 RPM is exceeded, reduce your airspeed below 110 knots. Lower the gear and flaps. Use sufficient manifold pressure to maintain flight. A minimum of 70 knots will be required. And land at the nearest suitable established field. Engine failures fall into two main categories, those occurring instantly and those giving ample warning. The instant failure is rare and usually occurs only if ignition or fuel flow fails completely. Monitor the engine instruments carefully and observe the operating limitations to guard against failure caused by your own carelessness or improper operating techniques. If you have indications that point to an engine failure and altitude can be maintained, check the boost pump on, mixture rich, propeller full increase, throttle full open, Ignition on both and fuel control valve handle on. Check the engine instruments for proper indications. Advise the tower of the emergency and state your intentions. Perform an ELP at the nearest established field. If you experience an engine failure and altitude cannot be maintained, assume a safe gliding attitude and activate the emergency fuel system. Set the prop to full increase, throttle full open, mixture idle cutoff, boost pump on, and turn the emergency fuel switch on. When the engine is running smoothly at full power, reduce the throttle to 25 inches MAP and retard the prop to 2200 RPM. Do not reduce the power below these settings as lower settings will cause an over-rich mixture resulting in a rough running engine. Advise the tower of your emergency and intentions and perform an ELP at the nearest established field.
In the event the engine did not start, you would have carried out emergency landing, ditching, or bailout procedures after you had accomplished the following. Turn the emergency fuel switch off. Boost pump off. Fuel control off. Ignition off. Battery off. And generator off. As instrument instruction is not given in primary flight training, instrument flight conditions should be avoided at all times. If actual instrument flight is encountered, attempt to regain visual flight conditions by making a shallow turn for 180 degrees. Be prepared to recover from an unusual attitude or accidental spin condition. To complete this emergency review, let's look at the procedures used for bailout and ditching. The decision to bail out should be made while there is still plenty of altitude and, if possible, while power and directional control are available. If time permits and the aircraft is controllable, make a radio distress call on tower frequency preceded by a mayday call giving your call sign, your position and altitude, stating that you have an actual emergency the cause of the emergency, and that you are bailing out. If dual, warn the other pilot to prepare for bailout and receive an acknowledgement. Reduce your airspeed as much as practicable with flaps lowered, trim slightly nose down, and head for an uninhabited area. Now, prepare to bail out. Disconnect your radio cords. Blow the canopy open. Raise the seat full up, tighten your parachute straps, and release your safety belt and shoulder harness. Now, position yourself in the seat to bail out. Dive for the trailing edge of the right wing, and when clear of the aircraft, pull the ripcord handle. Now let's review the procedures for ditching. If time permits, transmit a mayday report. Disconnect your radio cords. Lock your shoulder harness. Unbuckle your parachute straps. Blow open the canopy. Check the landing gear up. Lower the flaps and turn the battery off. Make a normal approach with power if possible. Approach the stall attitude at a speed at which full control of the aircraft can be maintained. Now, plan your landing direction. In calm seas, land into the wind. In moderate seas, land parallel to the swells. In high seas, 25 knots of wind or more, land into the wind, attempting to land on the upwind side of a swell. Release your seat belt only after the aircraft has come to a full stop and abandon the aircraft. This completes the unit reviewing the procedures used to handle immediate emergencies with the T-34 aircraft. Return to the program text. The projector will rewind automatically. This film will show the procedures used with the T-34 aircraft in performing an approach turn stall. This type of stall will occur if the aircraft exceeds the stalling angle of attack during the landing approach. 
To perform an approach turn stall, first establish slow flight. Then complete and report the stall checklist and the quantity of gas in each tank. At the start of the last 90 degree of clearing, retard the throttle to 16 inches. Then complete the clearing turn in a descent at 70 knots and retrim. Next, establish a 30 degree bank turn to the left. Gradually close the throttle while raising the nose until the stall occurs, maintaining 30 degrees angle of bank. At the stall, apply full throttle and lower the nose to a point just below the normal cruise attitude. Then level the wings and raise the nose to stop the loss of altitude when flying speed is regained. This completes the unit on the approach turn stall. Return to the program text. The projector will rewind automatically. A power-off spiral is a prolonged gliding turn at a constant airspeed, a maneuver that enables you to lose altitude while remaining over a specific area. To perform a power-off spiral, start in normal cruise with the aircraft aligned on a prominent landmark or section line. Then close the throttle. Maintain altitude and heading and retrim as airspeed decreases. As your airspeed approaches 90 knots, lower the nose to the 90 knot gliding attitude while rolling into a 30 degree banked turn. Maintain this attitude with 30 degrees of bank for 360 degrees of turn. Clear the engine at each 500 foot level by advancing and retarding the throttle to 18 to 20 inches manifold pressure. Anticipate reaching the original heading and roll without hesitation into a 30 degree banked turn in the opposite direction. Maintain 90 knots and your 30 degree angle of bank for another 360 degrees. At the completion of the second turn, roll out on the original heading. Maintain a 90 knot glide and transition to normal cruise at the next 500 foot level. This completes the unit on T-34 power off spiral. Return to the programmed text. The projector will rewind automatically.
The skidded turn stall can occur whenever the aircraft is flown in a skid. Most often it'll occur in a power-off approach to a landing. This maneuver demonstrates the increased stalling speed caused by unbalanced flight. To demonstrate this maneuver, your instructor will enter an 85-knot glide with gear down and the throttle closed. He will then enter a 30-degree bank turn to the right and raise the nose slightly, deliberately flying in unbalanced flight in a skid until the stall occurs. At the stall, the aircraft will enter a sudden pronounced roll to the right. Your instructor will recover by applying full throttle while neutralizing the controls. He will then level the wings and raise the nose to stop the loss of altitude. This completes the unit on the skidded turn stall. Return to the program text. The projector will rewind automatically. This film will show the procedures used with the T-34 aircraft in flying the home field assistance pattern. The home field assistance pattern is a circular pattern flown in a left-hand orbit at 1,800 feet, a duty runway distance from the intended point of landing. If you need assistance prior to landing at home field, Notify the tower, giving your side number and stating your problem and intentions. The tower will then advise you to enter the assistance pattern. In the event the 1,800-foot assistance pattern was unusable, the tower would have advised you to orbit clear of the control zone, visual flight rules, until advised where an assistance aircraft would join you. If you are unable to contact the tower by radio, enter the pattern. Your aircraft will be spotted by the tower operators, the RDO, or another aircraft, and an assistance aircraft will be sent to join you. Upon being joined by the assistance aircraft, concentrate on flying your aircraft. The other aircraft will fly close enough to you to check visually for any problems with your aircraft. If your problem is a landing gear malfunction, the assistance pilot will make a rotary motion with a closed fist, followed by a thumbs up if your gear appears down and locked. Had they not appeared down and locked, he would have made the rotary motion with his fist, followed by a thumbs down. Follow the instructions of the assistance aircraft and the tower. In the case where you have lowered your landing gear in the 1800 foot assistance pattern and you were instructed to land, descend and enter the traffic circle at a reduced airspeed. If your radio is inoperative, the assistance aircraft will notify the tower when you begin your entry into the landing pattern. This completes the unit on the procedures used with the T-34 aircraft in flying the home field assistance pattern. Return to the programmed text. The projector will rewind automatically.
Any landing which is made with a wind not directly down the runway is called a crosswind landing. It is necessary to learn crosswind procedures, as you will frequently be required to use runways which are not directly into the wind. The direction of a crosswind is determined by the direction the wind is blowing across the landing line. An undershooting crosswind blows across the landing line from the right and causes a tendency to undershoot the landing line and angle in toward the runway. An overshooting crosswind blows across the landing line from the left, causing a tendency to overshoot the landing line. Crosswinds, whether undershooting or overshooting, affect the entire landing pattern. Therefore, the pilot must apply crosswind corrections throughout the entire pattern. The direction and velocity of the crosswind will be the determining factor in applying these corrections. There are two basic techniques used to overcome the effects of crosswinds, the crab and the wing low technique. The crab method is used on the upwind and downwind legs of the landing pattern and is accomplished by heading the aircraft into the wind in balanced flight as necessary to maintain the desired track over the ground. The wing low technique is used on final approach and is accomplished by lowering the upwind wing into the wind and using opposite rudder to keep the nose aligned with the runway. In this way, the aircraft will not land in a drift which would subject the landing gear to sheer stress. In making a crosswind approach and landing, Follow the standard field entry procedures. On the downwind leg, the aircraft will have a tendency to drift as the crosswind will tend to push the aircraft away from the path it is heading. To counteract this drift, set up a crab into the wind and maintain a wingtip distance parallel to the landing line. You must consider the effect the wind will have on the aircraft during your approach turn. The pattern over the ground should be the same as in normal into the wind landing. Vary your angle of bank and reduce throttle as necessary to fly a normal approach pattern. Upon intercepting the landing line, lower the upwind wing and use opposite rudder. In this way, you are slipping into the wind to counteract the crosswind effects on the aircraft. Make a normal transition to the landing attitude and touch down low wheel first. Maintain the landing attitude controlling direction with rudder alone. It may be necessary to maintain your aileron correction into the wind to prevent the crosswind from lifting your upwind wing. Take off in a normal manner. And when airborne, establish a crab to maintain direction straight out from the runway center line. This completes the unit on T-34, crosswind approaches and landing. Return to the program text. The projector will rewind automatically. A spin is an aggravated stall resulting in auto rotation. The aircraft is completely stalled, falling toward the ground, nose low, following a corkscrew path through the air. This film will show the spin recovery procedures used with the T-34 aircraft. First, complete the stall checklist, check the fuel quantity, and make the voice report. Then check the altimeter for a minimum altitude of 4,500 feet. Align the aircraft with a prominent landmark or section line to be used as a reference in the spin. Now 
make your clearing turns. At the start of the last 90 degrees of clearing turn, close the throttle. Complete the last 90 degrees of clearing turn with 75 knots or less and with the nose 15 degrees above the normal cruise attitude. Do not retrim. Just prior to the stall, lead with rudder in the desired direction of rotation. At the stall, apply full rudder, then full back stick. The aircraft will now start into a spin. As the aircraft spins, look at the horizon to maintain orientation. Start the recovery when your reference line passes the nose the second time. To recover, neutralize the rudder and then put the stick in the neutral position. When rotation stops, level the wings and raise the nose to the 100 knot climb attitude. Check the oil pressure, then smoothly apply full throttle. Recovery should be made under 140 knots and above 3,000 feet. This completes the unit on spins. Stop the projector and return to the programmed text. An aircraft cannot spin unless it has first been stalled. All accidental spins result from unintentional stalls. Accidental spins are introduced so that you can recognize the signs of an approaching spin and affect recovery before the spin actually develops. An accidental spin may develop from any altitude, airspeed, or power setting. For instance, if the nose of the aircraft is held too high in a climbing turn, the aircraft may stall and spin. Excessive skidding in turns produces an airspeed loss and the aircraft may stall and enter a spin. If you hold the nose of the aircraft too high in a glide, it will stall and spin. Accidental spins at low altitude are especially dangerous as there is usually insufficient altitude for safe recovery. The recovery from an accidental spin is exactly the same as with the intentional spin. The only difference is that if power is on, close the throttle first. Then apply rudder and stick to the neutral position. When rotation stops, level the wings and raise the nose to the 100 knot attitude. Check the oil pressure and smoothly apply full power. Remember, the time to prevent an accidental spin is during the approach to the stall, not after the spin is developed. This completes the unit on accidental spins. Return to the programmed text. The projector will rewind automatically. An unusual attitude is flight involving an extreme attitude and airspeed combination which is not normally encountered and which requires a positive recovery technique. For example, finding yourself disoriented or in an unsafe situation during an acrobatic maneuver or as a result of improperly performing an acrobatic maneuver. The objectives of the unusual attitude recovery are to prevent the aircraft from departing controlled flight, 
and to avoid overstressing the aircraft. With the stall checklist complete, the instructor will normally put the aircraft into an attitude not used during a regular syllabus. In this case, a nose low unusual attitude. To effect recovery, first close the throttle. Roll your wings level and raise the nose to the level flight attitude. When level, check your oil pressure and apply full power. If you were nose low inverted, close the throttle and roll wings level in the shortest direction toward the side with the most sky visible. Always make sure that your wings are level before pulling your nose up. This prevents a rolling pullout which could result in an overstress situation. When you reach a level flight attitude, check the oil pressure and apply full power. To recover from a nose-high unusual attitude, first apply full throttle. Then lower the nose to the level flight attitude and level the wings. If you are inverted and nose-high, apply full power and roll the wings level in the shortest direction and return to level flight. If the attitude of your aircraft is extremely nose high, apply full power but do not push over. Apply aileron and rudder to perform a wing over type recovery. When the nose is slightly below the horizon, pull out using coordinated aileron and rudder and return to level flight. This completes the unit on T-34 Unusual Attitudes. Return to the program text. The projector will rewind automatically. The progressive spin is a secondary spin in the opposite direction, characterized by an increased rate of rotation and additional loss of altitude. Your instructor will demonstrate a progressive spin to show what can occur if improper recovery procedures are used in recovering from a normal spin. The instructor will enter a normal spin and at the completion of one turn, if below 95 knots, he will apply full opposite rudder while holding full back stick. The aircraft will then start spinning in the opposite direction. The instructor will then immediately recover as from a normal spin. This completes the unit on progressive spin. Return to the program text. The projector will rewind automatically. A no-flap approach and landing follows the same pattern as a full-flap landing with only slight differences in the procedures.
A no-flap approach is necessary in high or gusty winds or in the event of an electrical failure. The procedures for a no-flap landing begin when you are established on the downwind leg of the landing pattern at a wingtip distance from the intended landing line at 500 feet and 90 knots. Prior to a point of beam the upwind end of the runway, make a voice report to your instructor. Gear down. Brakes firm. Parking brake in. Temperatures and pressures normal. Fly the downwind leg at a wingtip distance from the landing line at an altitude of 500 feet and an airspeed of 90 knots. Prior to a point of beam the intended point of landing, throttle back to 16 inches, advance prop to full increase, and start a transition to 85 knots. When you reach a point of beam the intended point of landing, start a gradual descending turn toward the landing line. Trim the aircraft for an 85 knot approach attitude. Check gear down and report landing checklist complete. Vary your power and angle of bank so as to intercept the landing line at 80 knots with 100 to 125 feet of altitude and six to eight hundred feet of straightaway. For a no-flap approach, your airspeed for the straightaway will be 80 knots. When you are five to ten feet off the runway, close the throttle and start your landing transition. Maintain this landing transition during rollout. If you are making touch-and-go landings, smoothly advance the throttle to take off again. Climb out at 80 knots and trim. Upon reaching 300 feet, if you are number one with interval, you may turn downwind. If you had not been number one with interval, you would have continued climbing straight ahead to the 500 foot level. Then, when you were number one with interval, you would have turned downwind. When you reach 500 feet, level off, transition to 90 knots, and establish a wingtip distance from the landing line. You are now ready for another touch and go. This completes the unit on T-34 no-flap landings. Return to the program text. The projector will rewind automatically. This film will review some of the procedures you may be required to execute in the event you have a damaged aircraft. The most common cause of T-34 airborne damage is a hard landing. Other causes include bird strikes, clipping treetops following touch-and-go landings, and the most severe, a mid-air collision with another aircraft. If you sustain damage to your aircraft at altitude, and the aircraft is out of control, and control cannot be regained, bail out. If your aircraft is controllable, start climbing to or maintain a minimum of 5,000 feet, headed toward the nearest established field, and make a mayday report. The flight and stall characteristics of your aircraft may be unpredictable, so be careful as you slow to minimum test speeds. Test the flight characteristics with the gear and flaps down, maintaining a minimum of 85 knots. If flap damage is suspected, 
maintain a minimum of 90 knots with flaps up. Student pilots will conduct this test only under the supervision of an instructor pilot in an assist plane. If the tests of your aircraft prove satisfactory, fly a wide, easy landing pattern maintaining at least 10 knots above the minimum test air speeds for your aircraft configuration. If you make a hard landing that may have resulted in structural or gear damage, and if you are still on the runway, execute a full stop landing if sufficient runway is available. Do not attempt to taxi. In the case of a hard landing in which you are airborne, leave the landing gear down and have them inspected by another aircraft. Do not raise the gear as they may stick in the wells. If the inspection reveals no visual damage, execute a normal landing, stop on the runway and do not attempt to taxi. If visual damage had been confirmed, you would have executed the appropriate emergency procedures. This completes the unit on airborne damage. Return to the programmed text. The projector will rewind automatically. altitude emergency, an emergency that occurs below 1,500 feet. A low altitude emergency might occur after takeoff or during a wave off from a simulated emergency. The simulated emergency is initiated by your instructor, closing the throttle at a minimum altitude of 500 feet. When the throttle is closed, immediately transition to a safe gliding attitude and select a landing area. Any maneuvering will depend on your altitude and your airspeed at the time the emergency occurs. Maintaining flying speed is most important. If your emergency occurs soon after you're airborne, do not attempt to turn back to the field. You would be low and slow, and your chances of stalling would be great. Check prop in full increase and mixture rich. Fuel boost pump and fuel selector on and check harness locked. When the field is made, lower the gear, lower flaps as desired, and check the canopy open. The instructor will initiate wave off by taking positive control of the aircraft and transition to a normal climb and retrim. Control of the aircraft will then be transferred back to the student. The emergency is considered complete upon reaching 1,000 feet of altitude. This completes the unit on low altitude emergency. Return to the program text. The projector will rewind automatically. The power off stall might occur while you are descending in an actual or simulated emergency. Recovery is made with power off, so you will become proficient in recovering from a stall without power in the event of an actual engine failure. Prior to performing your power off stall, complete the stall checklist. Fuel boost pump, off. Shoulder harness and seat belt, tight and locked. Prop, set at full increase. Canopy, 
closed and locked. Directional gyro, caged. Bilges, clear of foreign objects. Then report, stall checklist complete, and the number of gallons of gas in each tank. Make certain the airspace near you is clear by completing clearing turns. Clearing turns will be made with at least 45 degrees of bank for two 90 degree turns or one 180 degree turn. At the start of the last 90 degrees of clearing turn, close the throttle. Complete the turn in a 90 knot glide and retrim. Raise the nose 15 degrees above the normal cruise attitude. Maintain this attitude with wings level and in balanced flight. At the stall, apply positive forward stick. Place the nose slightly below the 90 knot gliding attitude. When the airspeed reaches 90 knots, resume the 90 knot glide. This completes the unit on the power off stall. Return to the program text. The projector will rewind automatically. This film will review the procedures used with the T-34 aircraft for bailout and ditching. The decision to bail out should be made while there is still plenty of altitude and, if possible, while power and directional control is still available. If time permits and the aircraft is controllable, make a radio distress call on tower frequency, preceded by a mayday call giving your call sign, your position and altitude, stating that you have an actual emergency, the cause of the emergency, and that you are bailing out. If dual, warn the other pilot to prepare for bailout and receive an acknowledgement. Reduce your airspeed as much as practicable with flaps lowered, trim slightly nose down, and head for an uninhabited area. Now prepare to bail out. Disconnect your radio cords. Blow the canopy open. Raise the seat full up. Tighten your parachute straps and release your safety belt and shoulder harness. Now, position yourself in the seat to bail out. Dive for the trailing edge of the right wing, and when clear of the aircraft, pull the ripcord handle. Now, let's review the procedures for ditching. If time permits, transmit a mayday report. Disconnect your radio cords, Lock your shoulder harness. Unbuckle your parachute straps. Blow open the canopy. Check the landing gear up. Lower the flaps and turn the battery off. Make a normal approach with power if possible. Approach the stall attitude at a speed at which full control of the aircraft can be maintained. Now, plan your landing direction. 
in calm seas land into the wind. In moderate seas land parallel to the swells. In high seas, 25 knots of wind or more, land into the wind, attempting to land on the upwind side of a swell. Release your seat belt only after the aircraft has come to a full stop and abandon the aircraft. This completes the unit on the procedures used with the T-34 aircraft in bailout and ditching. Return to the program text. The projector will rewind automatically. This film will show the takeoff procedures used with the T-34 aircraft. The takeoff is the movement of the aircraft along the runway from its starting position to the point where it leaves the ground with flying speed. Scan the runway and approach area for landing aircraft. Check the tower for any signals at the hold short line. Check the time. And when all is clear, taxi into the takeoff position on the runway. Make sure the nose wheel is aligned with the runway. The actual time spent in the takeoff position should be minimal. If on a dual flight, report to your instructor that the takeoff checklist is complete, that you have checked the tower, give the time, and state that you are ready for takeoff. After the instructor has acknowledged this report, and the nose wheel of the aircraft taking off ahead is off the runway, commence the takeoff roll. With heels on the deck and toes on rudder and the stick in a neutral position, apply power smoothly to full throttle. It is important to detect any small changes in heading and apply corrections immediately. Remember that torque will tend to pull the nose of the aircraft to the left control direction with rudders alone. As takeoff power becomes effective, right rudder pressure will be necessary to maintain a straight heading. When good response to elevator control is felt, about 50 to 55 knots, smoothly apply back pressure to the stick, lifting the nose wheel off the deck. This nose attitude is slightly above the taxi attitude. Hold this attitude and fly the aircraft off the deck. When a safe landing can no longer be made on the runway, raise the gear. Check the gear indicators for an up indication. Maintain the takeoff attitude until reaching 100 knots. Then establish a 100 knot climb, conform to local course rules on departure. This completes the unit on takeoff. Return to the program text. The projector will rewind automatically.